three faces here. I appreciate it. I saw it three faces. Really? Yeah. Come on. There he is. I couldn't find my I couldn't find my agenda. <laughs> I do not want it. Thank you. Well, that's good. It's Disclosure of pecuniary interests? Yes, I have one. Okay. I have a disclosure on item 5.4, the feed in tariff. Okay. Um, my wife has a conditional offer on a microfit uh, with respect to our residents at 67 Meadows Crescent, and therefore there could be some kind of indirect pecuniary interest. Therefore, I'll declare a conflict on that and refrain from being taking part or voting on that matter. Okay. Is there anyone else? <laughs> Do we need to make a motion? Um, you need a motion to adopt the agenda. No, I'll have to no. Okay. Okay. So, can I get a motion to adopt the in-camera minutes? So moved. All in favor? Okay. Um, the consent agenda. Um, what items have been pulled here? 4 so 4.3, 4 4.7. Is there any others? Okay. Uh, motion to remove the balance of the agenda. Move it. Okay. All in favor? Okay. Uh, item. <laughs> <laughs> so item 4.3, <coughs> I believe it's a regional councilor. Yes. Okay. And, and some of the questions, even if I receive the information later, okay. I guess what I'm wondering is, uh, first question, page three, the town's portion of intersection improvements, that's at Wesley Road in Finley. I, could you just refresh my memory as to what our portion yes. would be? Truly. Um, we carried out uh, a traffic calming uh, review on Finley, and this is about two years ago. <coughs> and at that time, there were some uh, there were traffic calming measures that were implemented on Finley. But one of the recommendations was for turn lanes at the intersection of Wesley to facilitate traffic that was backing up. And uh, it, it was both a left turn lane north and a left turn lane south, I believe. And in the course of planning for those intersection improvements and uh, with discussions with the region, we found out that in addition to the improvements we wanted to make, 
they were also planning to make improvements at that intersection, turning lanes east west on West Street and uh, signal light improvements. So we wanted to coordinate those works with them. And that's been the problem is getting them to bring that forward in the budget. So our responsibility responsibility is the northbound and southbound and theirs are the east west. Am I that's correct? correct. Okay. I just want to uh, yes. clarify that. And I guess my next question because of the <coughs> number of items which are very important to Ajax and the region. Do we have a, a cost because these, um, I believe all, all of them would have been included or most of them in the region's capital forecast. I guess my concern is do we have a priority of any of these and the cost because I know what will happen when it goes to the region it will be compared with priorities and other municipalities as well so I don't need that information now but if I could have some sort of estimate of what each of these would cost the regional cost and if there were any sort of priorities for Ajax if, if that happened in that event because I expect the response will be there are a number of priorities everywhere and of course the need far exceeds their um, what they have to work with as far as their budget. I am pretty sure we have estimates for the majority and so I will get those for you and then I'll talk to staff about what we feel would be the highest of those in terms of priority and get that for you. Thank you. I know from our point of view we'd like them all done. Absolutely. Yes. And mm -hmm. I I just want to make a comment on, on this item. Um, I think that one of the problems with the regional capital road program is that the region of Durham has way too many roads that aren't truly regional roads or might have once been but are no longer. Ajax examples of course are Church Street and Harvard Avenue and we've gone through a rationalization uh, with the region on that. But there are numerous roads uh, in various parts of the region that should not be regional roads. And it's because the region has this excessive burden of roads that they can't discharge their responsibilities on roads that are truly regional roads. When we look at what happened with Bailey, Victoria, this was supposed to be done five years ago. It was pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. They're just starting it now. And I don't think it's an accident that this whole construction season was basically missed and it's basically been pushed out in 13 and 14 to do that. Look what's happening on Westney Road. Westney needs to be four lanes right up to Roslyn Road now and it needs to be four lanes up to Taunton Road in the not too distant future. When that plaza gets fully built out at Taunton and Westney, the traffic load there will increase dramatically. And it's being pushed out and pushed out. The section from Roslyn North isn't even in the five year forecast. And that's a real problem. Um, you know, the top lift on Salem, I mean, that should be a no-brainer if they top lift that. And if it goes too long, once you've done the reconstruction and the base course to your top lift, you start doing damage to the road. I mean, <clears throat> so I think we need to send a signal to the region that they really need to rationalize their whole program and therefore put in the money in a timely way into truly regional roads and get a, a definition that we all can agree on on what are regional roads. If it, if it doesn't have a four, if it, you know, a 401 or 400 series interchange, that's a regional road. Certain east-west roads, uh, major arterials are regional roads. Um, there, there's a few others, north-south roads like, like, like Lake Ridge. Um, and there's some regional roads that, that aren't regional roads. I mean, Roslyn Road, goes right across the region, it should be a regional road. It's not. So this needs to be rationalized and the, and the region keeps putting back dealing with this problem. It has a lot of 
municipalities and a lot of politicians are going to get their nose out of joint because they're going to lose having regional roads taken care of for them and not done at the local level. But everybody suffers by this. And, you know, the, the Bailey Victoria thing is just every day you see the backlog on that backing up into Pickering because of a two lane bottleneck between Shoal Point and, uh, and uh, the other side of the wind. So I just wanted to make that comment that we really need to push the region to address it. <coughs> Councillor Nice. Thank you. Well, just to comment further on that, it's not just about the regional roads either. They have delayed some of uh, the resurfacing of local roads because they need to do servicing. It's happened on Boland. It happened on <coughs> Parks and Vale around that area. And it's now happening on Lincoln. And it keeps getting pushed out and pushed out and pushed out. And it's very, very frustrating. They keep putting it off and putting it off. And so I was, I mean, we were promised uh, Lincoln would be done last year. Now it was, they put the RFP in spring and then it was the fall. Now it's not going out till next spring. So maybe that's something our regional councillors can, you know, speak to uh, staff about and find out what's going on. Because we're a little tired of waiting for them to do what they promised to do. So what, what are we proposing here? Are there some directions to our regional councillors or what, what, how do you want to wrap this up? Well, for me, it's just that, that there's, there needs to be an awareness, too, that those resurfacing projects that we've planned to do are being put on hold until they can do the servicing. You're not going to dig up. We're not going to resurface the road, and then they come back in and dig it up to the servicing, and then we resurface the road again. So, it, you know, there's a whole lot of projects that are being put on hold because the region's not taking responsibility or maybe not financially planning properly. I don't know. But... Um, it would be nice to see some to see these projects move forward. Sorry, um, regional councillor Collier. I'll just I'll just reply that quickly. It, 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 it is a money issue. It's just the the funds aren't there to do it. So obviously projects are getting pushed out. And Colleen said some works. I said on finance. We we talk about it all the time. All these different things. But when it comes to it, and we we're going through the budget process now, when we see the budget, we're gonna I expect to see Westy pushed out and I was going, I'm glad to see this report today because I was going to speak to it at budget time but even better if we have this beforehand but but that's why the funds just aren't there to do it that's the way Mr. Clapp has explained it <coughs> okay Sorry, go ahead. And for you to council caller then um, for example residents were advised of these proposed works that were going to happen by the region when there's a change in budget then that does not allow them to move forward, do they advise them at that time as well? No, they don't. And when the councillors are out talking to people and telling them, they're asking when is Wesley going to be done, and I tell them it's going to be done in 2012 and it's not done, I'm the one that looks bad and that's what's happening. That's right. And th there is no notification, no. There should be. I know there should be. Thank you. Um, Councillor, do you have your hand up? Well, I guess and going back to this about the and Mayor Parrish's comments, maybe that's what uh, it's going to take forever for them to do the whole rationalization of roads. I think. I mean, we worked well with them, the town, and we made some good progress. I'm wondering if we um, attach to this an amendment that uh, roads that that perform a regional function should be a priority because I think that's true, you know, whether it's in Ajax or in, um, in Whitby, wherever, because if you're going, you know, from Ajax to Whitby, you're, if you don't use the 401, you're gonna use a regional road, would be my guess. So, okay, so before we get to that amendment, um, Mayor Parrish. Well, I, I just wanna make this, this further point, and we could do that, Councillor Jordan, but <clears throat> regional staff is well aware of the of the problem as I've outlined it in terms of rationalizing the road system. And if you brought forward something, they would be cheerleaders for it. But the problem that we have is the same problem that we have with representation. Mm -hmm. And that's why people have to understand that regional rep fair regional representation isn't just about, you know, a bunch of politicians uh, arguing over who's going to have the most votes. It's, it's a matter of, of the region addressing regional priorities. 
it is not a coincidence that most of the non-regional, that is they shouldn't be, but our regional roads are in the city of Oshawa. The city of Oshawa is grossly overrepresented at regional council. And therefore, you bring up the subject of rationalizing roads, those eight votes out of 28, a significant chunk, run to the, to the barricades and they say no way. Just like they're saying no way on rationalizing fair representation because they know that things like having a boatload of regional roads funded by the region instead of by Oshawa is some of the things that will go by the wayside. It's a systemic problem. And the region, and you know, Councillor Collier and Councillor Mitchell of Whitby right now have a notice of motion in front of regional council to address that issue. Until it's addressed, a lot of bread and butter issues that people will really understand like not getting their regional roads done in a timely way and gridlock and all those good things, they have to understand these dots connect. And if we don't address these issues, some things that will really affect them in a meaningful way won't get addressed. So, you know, um, Ajax has shown leadership in this. We've rationalized Church and Hardwick and, and the Salem uh, trade-off, which make eminent sense. But other municipalities like Oshawa are refusing to do that, and they have the votes to stonewall it, which is really everyone suffers for that. <clears throat> so, um, Regional Councilor Tori, did you want to make an uh, add an amendment to um, to the staff report? Yes, I think uh, I'll refer to staff. That follows, I think, what we're saying here <coughs> in our municipality. Does it not? Mm -hmm. That um, that um, roads that serve a regional function should be a priority in the regional 2013 budget and capital forecast. Was, was that? Yeah, we can work on the wording. Okay. Want to change it a little? I think you know what I mean. Yes. So on, on the amendment, um, you'll move it? Yes. Um, all in favor on that amendment? Okay. And, and on the main motion, you'll move that? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. <coughs> okay um, item 4.7, um, designation of officers for the St. Francis Center liquor sales license application. I believe that was you. That was me. I think when I was reading this, I I wasn't quite sure. Maybe it's me, but I wasn't sure. Does this designation apply for our own town municipal events? <coughs> Because this facility, we hold events, and, and I understand people can also uh, rent it for their own private functions. So could you just explain? The designation of officers is part of the application process to get the facility <coughs> licensed. Um, and then once it's licensed, we can decide what kind of alcohol events we'll have, our own third party. Um, you know, we're working on that process and deciding um, how we'll use that license, but we have to have officers designated as part of the application form to become a licensed facility. So that's what this is for. It's just to name those individuals. So this is a step in the process. It is. It's one step in the process. That's right. <coughs> part of the application form package. Thank you. And we'll hear more as yes. we work yep. with the Thank you. I'll move it. Okay, move it. Um, all in favor? Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, so item four, five point one, um, Ajax sustainability journey video. So through the chair, good afternoon. Um, I'm here to screen the town's latest video entitled Ajax's Sustainability Journey. 
The 10 minute video uh, will officially be unveiled to the community um, on November 27th at the Integrated Sustainability Plan Showcase. The video was produced for a number of reasons, to uh, chronicle and promote the town's sustainability efforts to date, to engage the public and provide visual context of our work in a compelling and creative way, to highlight key messages and the need for action, and to provide council and staff with an interactive resource for presentations, speaking engagements, etc. And at this time, I'd like to acknowledge uh, two very special co contributors to the video, uh, Mr. William Parrish, who narrated the video. Uh, Mr. Parrish was the perfect choice as he has witnessed the town's journey firsthand. And Andrew Jackson, who helped provide the illustrations. Uh, his work in the video is incredible and it really helps to convey the town's message in a simple and creative way. Since our incorporation almost 60 years ago, the town of Ajax has been on a sustainability journey. With each step, every decision and unexpected turn of events, the town has courageously led the way to ensuring a high quality of life for our residents. Before Ajax was incorporated in 1955, it was the site of the largest medicine plant in the British Empire during World War II. After the war, the area was turned over to Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation to be developed into Canada's first fully planned industrial community. CMHC produced a model development comprised of subdivisions, interconnected roads, state-of-the-art servicing, employment lands, and a town center, a place where people could live and work was born. Since then, under the stewardship of successive councils, Ajax has continued to be a leader. A key example that would help shape our identity was a 1959 Ajax Council decision to protect a 120 meter wide ribbon of land along the town's waterfront and maintain it as green space. Today, our waterfront is a highly valued jewel and one of the most extensive publicly owned waterfronts in Ontario, boasting 70 hectares of groomed and natural waterfront land, pavilions, bridges, creeks, coastal wetlands, plus a seven kilometer recreational trail. As a proud Great Lakes community, we recognize the importance of protecting our limited, dwindling fresh water. We proactively conduct exercises to head off potential downstream impacts on our watersheds. And we continue to aggressively work to assess and find ways to address issues threatening Lake Ontario, such as escalating levels of E. coli and excessive algal growth. As 100% of our drinking water comes from Lake Ontario, the town samples stormwater regularly at monitoring stations and we have more than 55 stormwater management ponds to improve water quality. Residents and businesses are encouraged to help by conserving water and changing activities so fewer pollutants <coughs> are released into Lake Ontario. Our water quality work has inspired us to bring back a beach to the Ajax waterfront and make it a blue flag destination, a place where residents and visitors can swim safely. In addition, our work has raised the town's profile around the Great Lakes Basin. The town has won the Wedgie Foundation Sustainable Cities Award, and we were one of the few communities in Canada recognized as a blue community for our position that water is central to all human activity. The town has also adopted new environment first official plan policies to improve the town's environmental footprint and adapt to severe weather and climate change factors. 
recently, we initiated a unique environmental assessment process that examined flood risk in the southern Carruthers Creek watershed posed by proposed urbanization to the north outside of the town's boundary. As a result, we know what infrastructure and planning decisions are needed to reduce flood risks. We are also very proud of our open green space and we're one of the first municipalities in Ontario to boldly establish a fixed urban boundary. This decision protected rural areas and prime agricultural soils. The greater significance of this decision was fully realized when we successfully lobbied the province to integrate more than 2,000 hectares of ecologically sensitive areas, rural landscape and farmland into the Greenbelt plan. Today, we have protected more than 5,500 hectares of open space and environmentally significant land. One of our popular open spaces is the Greenwood Conservation Area. It offers a place for residents to escape and enjoy outdoor activities, from bird watching to hiking, literally in their own backyard. The town's streets and neighborhoods are lined with healthy and maintained trees. Our long-term goal is to achieve a 40% urban forest canopy. All new municipal facilities are built to lead standards. Our innovative fire and emergency headquarters features a living green roof, and our state-of-the-art operations center uses solar panels to generate 100,000 kilowatt hours of electricity annually. And in early 2013, we will open our first lead designed community center. We strongly support walking, cycling, and the use of public transportation. We have an extensive network of trails, dedicated bike lanes, and shared use lanes totaling well over 120 kilometers that connect to transit and rail hubs. For our investment, the town was recently named one of the first bicycle-friendly communities in Canada. At Ajax's Town Hall and Community Centers, we have implemented new waste solutions, producing high-quality organic matter for our parks and gardens. And lighting systems have been retrofitted in our arenas, gyms, and pools to increase energy efficiency and reduce energy costs. The town is a proud partner in a community garden with 70 plots. The garden has become a popular place for interaction and produce is shared with local agencies. Ajax led the Durham region in transforming to a green fleet. We have 12 hybrid and two fully electric vehicles, which has reduced fuel consumption by 1,000 liters and lower greenhouse gas emissions by 2.3 tons per year per vehicle. In addition, our new diesel engines and off-road equipment substantially cut emissions. However, sustainability is more than just implementing sustainable practices and limiting urban sprawl. Action and diverse neighborhoods and local employment are also vital pillars to a strong and healthy community. We are very proud to be the third fastest growing municipality in Ontario and welcome our growing diversity. This diversity presents continuous opportunities to collectively benefit from new ideas, talents, skills, and perspectives. Recognizing our unique makeup, we strongly embrace a creative community. The New St. Francis Center is a prime example of this. We restore an historic church slated for demolition and transform it into a multi-use community arts, cultural, and performance venue. This project has jump-started the revitalization of the Pickering Village area. With a growing population, Local jobs are essential. Recently, we became the first municipality in Canada to earn the competitive Ready Seal, proving our readiness to compete for investment and attract high-quality jobs to allow residents to live and work 
within Ajax. To conclude, we must understand sustainability is a journey, not a destination. Our journey began in the 1950s and carries on today as we continue to make decisions and take actions vital to sustaining Ajax as a vibrant and resilient community. To help guide us, we are developing an integrated community sustainability plan that will take us to our centennial anniversary in 2055. But we can't achieve our goals alone. To effectively deal with 21st century issues, Ajax's progress involves everyone. All levels of government need to work together. When we take the time to understand how our choices affect each other, we form the basis for common understanding and better decision making. Municipalities need predictable, sustained sources of funding from senior governments to implement planned, prioritized, sustainable actions. I am proud of Ajax's sustainability achievements, and I am certain our commitment to championing sustainability practices and innovation will extend far into the future. and of putting it together. Uh, just an absolute fantastic job. And uh, I'm honored to be a small part of it as, as the voice, but I had nothing to do with the genius. <laughs> <laughs> so don't give me any credit for that. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I think it's a beautiful selling thing for Ajax. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I might say to that I'm, I, I think it can be used for on many occasions in many different situations. And just as an example, I am using it. I'm, I'm speaking at the Liberal Cities Conference in Hamilton on the 30th of November. And I'm using that as my intro. And the giveaway is, uh, <coughs> is, a, is a stick that uh, will allow everybody to access it and, and link to our website, et cetera, et cetera. So it, I think it's a real, I think it's a great sales vehicle for what we've done and, and for the and for the municipality of the town. Okay, thank you. Just, uh, I thought it was fabulous, really, I'm impressed. Um, I just want to say that uh, thank you to Mr. Parrish for not only um, <coughs> speaking on the film, but also from the previous councils, the good decisions they made such as the public waterfront and so on, so that councillors coming after could build on that and do all the work. So thank you for all the work you've done over the years to make many of these things happen, too. And Andrew can draw incredibly fast. <laughs> 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 very well. Very fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, staff. All right, um, item. 5.2 um, Daily Harwood Development Update, uh, Mr. Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. <coughs> okay. uh, the report before you provides the latest update on the Bailey Harwood Development Proposal. 
Um, the transaction with Medallion pertaining to the sale of the land is closed, and the town has settled the expropriation value with the previous owners. As the committee is aware, there's a groundbreaking ceremony this Sunday at 2 p.m. at the Asia Community Center. Now, uh, this, pre this presentation provides an overview of where we've come from in terms of planning and development of the land, the strides to ensure that a landmark development is achieved in keeping with what a downtown is intended to be, the financial and other benefits that will accrue to the town, the region, and the community, and the latest development schedule. So the town's vision for its downtown is an, is an intensive, mixed-use, pedestrian-oriented, transit-supportive district functioning as the cultural and administrative center of the town forms the basis of the town's official plan, and zoning bylaw, and the downtown community improvement plan. They set the rules for the, for the development of a special place, a symbolic center and gathering place for all of the town's residents. They also acknowledge that the development of a vibrant downtown will not happen overnight. Positive change to achieve a vibrant downtown will be a long-term proposition and will have long-term and lasting benefits. Now, in order to keep true to the vision, the town has had to overcome some fundamental obstacles. This has been true regarding the development of the former Verona Mall site by Sundial Homes, the demolition of the old Atlas Tag Building, and it is true of this property. The previous owners of the site rejected the town's vision for a downtown and were motivated to continue with an unremarkable auto-oriented auto form of development that could be found on any suburban arterial road. Now, in May 2004, the previous owners filed appeals against the town's official plan and zoning bylaw prohibited the auto-oriented uses that included drive-throughs on the property. In August of 2005, we also received appeals from the previous owners regarding detailed downtown development policies and the implementing zoning bylaw that applied to their lands. And finally, in 2009, we received a site plan application for a commercial proposal on the property that fell significantly short of fulfilling town's planning objectives for the downtown. It didn't satisfy the town's minimum density requirements. There are no landmark buildings, massing, or an urban square, and buildings were intended to be set into the slope. The, build, er, the development was entirely auto-oriented. The majority of the site was proposed to be surface parking, nearly double of, of what is permitted for parking, loading, and service areas within the downtown. Provided for drive throughs which were prohibited by the town's policies. The development wasn't pedestrian-oriented, and no primary entrances faced the street. The building presented their backs to the street. Uh, the development was really an underdevelopment of the site. It didn't hit the minimum requirements for building coverage, building frontage, or minimum building heights. So in July of 2009, Council authorized the initiation of an expropriation as a critical step in advancing the development of a vibrant downtown. So over the next couple of years, development interest was found and a master plan was developed to see a comprehensive urban development site. So in July of 2011, the town entered into a development agreement, an agreement of purchase and sale with Medallion Developments to permit a high density residential commercial mixed use development. The total development would encompass six buildings, the first phase encompassing two buildings at the very north end of the site. The tallest buildings would be 25 stories in height, and phase one with building heights decreasing as you travel south. There would be ground floor retail and commercial uses and a two story office component. There'd be public uses and a civic square, underground parking below the proposed civic square, a future east-west re street that would cut through the site, provisions for public transit, and elements of a unifying theme relating to the town's history that would be incorporated into the development as well, as well as green and sustainable development provisions, things that related to uh, reducing the, the urban heat island effect, um, dealing with issues of stormwater and elements of bird-friendly design and um, on-site uh, reuse and recycling facilities. Now we're all quite aware of the phasing of the development. The first phase is the um, uh, phase which is going to be initiated very shortly. Uh, building A being the very north end of the site starting in 2013. Total number of units is 562 with nearly 50,000 square feet of uh, non-residential floor area including offices and retail uses. The second phase proceeding in about the 2016 time frame uh, so 754 units and uh, 700 square meters of non-residential floor area. And finally, the third phase um, in the 2020 <coughs> time frame, another 461 units and 600 square meters of non-residential floor area. Now, the first building, Building A, will be right next to Bailey Street. It will have some 284 residential units. Um, 
maybe uh, just over 6,000 square feet of retail uses, 30,000 square feet of offices, and a 25-story point tower. Um, this building will address uh, Bailey Street in a very pedestrian-oriented um, and positive manner. And building B, which will flank Bailey Square, um, 278 units and 6,000 square feet of retail, again, with a 25-story building. Now, in keeping with the town's vision for the downtown, the proposed development will provide density, a mix of uses, and a design that will contribute to the downtown as a people place. It will signify that this area of Ajax is intended to be special, where people will choose to visit, walk, shop, or work. The development will provide for a physical as well as symbolic connections to the community. The site will, pay, will provide a gathering place where people will pay homage to the past. The 1.8 acre Civic Spill will be named after Pat Bailey, the town's first mayor, and will recognize his contribution to the Allied war effort. Mr. Bailey and the workers of the munitions facility at DIL will be commemorated through public art and design features in the square. The site will be a gathering place for people. A 9,000 square foot reflecting pool and skating rink will be a focal point for the square. The square will have, a public, will have public and retail uses around its perimeter that will contribute to it being a vibrant place for the town. So as provided in the report, there are financial and other site benefits that will be provided as well. In addition to the $9 million price um, for the sale of the, net, of the land, the town will be the owner of the square. Public parking will be available within the development, and the town will be able to use 6,500 square feet of internal space rent-free. The developer will make financial contributions toward the extension of Kidney Drive as well. The overall value of the sale of the land and these other benefits are estimated in the order of $11.3 million. Now, as I noted at the beginning of the presentation, the acquisition cost for the land for the previous owner has now been settled. The initial payment of $5.5 million was provided under a Section 30 agreement that provided for the, the transfer of the site without prejudice to a final determination of market value. The balance of $8.5 million is owing as determined through the land appraisal process. Um, as provided for under the Expropriations Act, there's 6% interest that's required as well as paying for costs for legal, appraisal, planning, and engineering costs as required under the Expropriations Act. The town has incurred legal costs, and um, taking into account the payment by medallion, the town's investment in this property is about $7.1 million. Now, the financial value of the development cannot be understated in terms of the long-term taxes to be received by the town and the other benefits noted earlier. So we've undertaken a calculation for property tax revenue over an approximate 40 year period, where the town would be expected to receive about $36.5 million in property tax. If we deduct the net land acquisition cost, we anticipate with the other net benefits as noted, a net benefit to the town of $31,685,000. There are substantial long-term and short-term financial benefits to the region of Durham. Um, the region of Durham will be eligible to receive development charges um, and at the rate of $17.1 million, as well as substantial regional property taxes over the 30 year period. Um, the region has provided for a contribution under the regional revitalization plan to offset infrastructure costs and infrastructure relocation. So we see a long term net regional financial benefit of over $130 million over that same period. Now, of course, there are community benefits as well and these need to be understood. The annual spending power of approximately 3,200 new residents to the community is estimated at $71 million per year. And the figures in this slide start to reflect the financial shot in the arm that will be provided by this project, by a project of this magnitude, both in terms of local spending power, construction value, and direct and indirect salaries from construction-related employment. So in terms of the development schedule, uh, we have a shoring permit application that uh, I believe will be in, uh, received by the end of the month. Storing uh, will commence and excavation will start in January of 2013. Uh, we expect the submission of an underground parking structure and foundation permit application at that time, followed by an issuance of a foundation and underground parking structure permit in March, and full building permit issuance for the superstructure sometime in May. Now we've talked about the, uh, the uh, timing schedule with the, uh, with the developer and it's estimated that a project will take about 30 months once excavation starts. So on that basis, we see a completion date of, January, of June 30th, 2015 for the first phase of the development. Um, that concludes my presentation, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Councilor Brown? Yeah. 
Yes, thank you. A uh, question to Rob, uh, Mr. Ford, if I may. Uh, so, the numbers can be down to the individuals that don't understand accounting. So, in simple form, <laughs> um, we initially paid five and a half million, right? Correct. And we, we, we between the, the actual cost that the, was awarded by the OMB, et cetera, what it has been the cost of the town? Uh, three, Mr. Chairman, the, the net cost of the town for the additional appropriation cost is about $7.1 million. So that's the additional, it's basically the 16, <coughs> the, sorry, the 17.1 million less the $9 million paid by the okay. town. Okay, right. so, so the town's investment is $7 million. And the report says that over the next 20 years, the town will in, receive how much money? Uh, through the year, it's over 40 years, it's about $32 million. Over 42 years, $32 million for the town. Mm -hmm. and, and what is the, the, the amount of the region? Because well, that's a... Through through that, it's actually quite substantial. It's about $132 million over that same 40 years. Well, so, so the, this is a, a good news story that the town of Ajax, financially and visually, and we're going to be providing beautiful place in the town where people live and close to shopping, etc. And uh, that's the type of housing that's needed in the tracks. It's unfortunate that they're not going to be building condominiums until the third phase because I think they, they need it now. And I've spoken to them about it over and over again, but uh, they need to have other residents of Ajax call them or come to the opening or the ground baking on Sunday and mention it to them. Uh, I have many friends that have left Ajax because they had to go to condominium type living that we don't have <coughs> or we don't have very little here. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to support this. I'm, and I know I'd like to thank staff because they've worked very hard for many, many months. And uh, congratulations. Thank you. Just if I can, Mr. Chair, just to kind of give it the context that, that we've looked at it as staff. In essence, for the town's $7 million investment, which is really what it is, $7.1 million, the direct actual tangible revenue that you can touch and feel to both the region and the town is about $165 million. So for $7 million, we're getting $165 million in actual cash development charges, you know, taxes. And that doesn't even include the purchasing power from the final slide, the construction jobs, uh, you know, which, which measures well over $2 billion. So but I think the number for me as an accountant, I guess, we, we like cold hard cash, is for $7 million, it's worth $165 million in actual revenue to <coughs> both the region and the town. That's how, you know, we sort of look at it from a an investment perspective, I guess, if you will, and, and in, in any market, that's a very good rate of return. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Retail yeah. Councilor Collier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just before I question further to Council Brown's comments, we um, not only have had residents leave the town, but also businesses, and there's over 72,000 square feet of office and ground floor retail space in this new development. And, um, we lost one of our one of the large employer search engine people because we just did not have adequate office space in Ajax. Uh, and they moved to to the uh, to, to Pickering, so uh, we want to be providing that because it's obviously much needed. So, so I'm glad to see that. But um, just again to to Mr. Ford on the financial side of things, um, the we've already paid five and a half million. When, when we expropriated land. So the difference, the two point something, what's the source of those funds? Uh, through the chair, our, our difference is we always look at it in terms of the difference between the 16, you know, rather than looking at the, the process as we went along, we look at, it, you know, the final cost was, you know, the, uh, the 16.1 million, we've got 9 million. So the funding gap, if you will, is, is $7.1 million. We, we already have three million dollars of that collected and sitting in the bank back starting in 2010. As council knows, the expropriation process takes a long time to figure out what you're ultimately going to be, you know, paying as you go through the OMB. It's the nature of the process. So we anticipated that the price might be slightly higher. Um, so we've already got three million sitting in the <coughs> slots. Um, our operating surplus uh, for 2012, 75% uh, of that does go into capital projects reserve. So that's about an, an additional 1.2 million. Council allocated 350,000 back in 2009. So really what we're 
I don't even want to use the term short, but really the remaining amount is about two and a half million dollars, and that's coming directly from the capital projects reserve. And that's a reserve that is exactly designed to fund these types of projects. So um, there's absolutely no impact on the current long range capital forecast. There'll be no projects will be moving out. Uh, there'll be no, uh, uh, our reserves are still very strong and so on. So it's, we're quite capable of, of funding this right now. And you just, you answered my next question. I just wanted an assurance that we're not going to be bumping out any other projects or nothing else will be affected as sort of a domino effect from this. It's true that you I would say yes, but I, I would maybe like to take the opportunity with council just to maybe reflect on the last three to four years. You know, as we've gone through an economic recession, we've undertaken a lot of projects that weren't in our forecast because certainly we didn't expect the, the federal and provincial governments to come up with infrastructure. So if you look over the last three to four years, we've made a lot of good investments in the town. We did the five infrastructure projects. Uh, we were doing this uh, expropriation for about $7 million. We, we've committed to the Pat Bailey Square and Pan Am Games. All very good investments. In terms of dollars, we've spent about $24 million, but we've leveraged an additional $12 million from other levels of government. So anytime you do that, it's a good thing. The only comment I would say to Council going forward is that, you know, certainly for the next number of years, we really will need to stick to projects that are in the long-range capital forecast. I said, you know, opportunities have, have presented themselves to us. They were the right decisions that we could afford them. But going forward, even if there is another round of infrastructure, you know, stimulus programs, we may need to take a pass on those and say, you know, we've uh, we spent our monies and participated. You know, we need to stick with what's in our forecast. That would be the only comment I would make to council going forward. But absolutely no impact on, on the projects that council will see when we bring the long range capital forecast in February. There'll be no surprises. Uh, <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Weiss? I just want to congratulate staff. I know this has been a huge project and you've done it in a very short period of time. It's been a lot of work and um, congratulations, you've done a great job. It's a really exciting project and a turning point for this town, I think. Um, it does address what we just saw in that video, urban sprawl. <coughs> and uh, according to the growth plan, we are now intensifying population in uh, urban centers and that means building up and as Councilor Brand spoke to it it, uh, it benefits needs that are in the community I, I've had people say well when when our children leave the nest they have to go to the city to find an apartment when they get married and don't have the down payment for a home they need an apartment they have to go into the city so it's really nice to be able to keep our community in the community I have a question though with respect to the square when do you anticipate the plan of the square coming forward for council to review? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the design of the square is currently being worked on. And uh, as council will recall, the, uh, the timing for the construction of the square is to coincide with the issuance of the permit for the second building in phase one, which is anticipated in the spring of 2014. So our plans are to consult with council during the design. So you should, we will be before council in the late winter spring with uh, further iterations of the design. As you know, we've met with council and have approval for the concept designs, but they are evolving and uh, we're working on the further details. But we'll be checking in from time to time to the, until we get to that date. And the that award would be to the answer is the spring of 14. At the earliest. But the design will come prior to that. It is, the design will, will be checking in from time to time. And so we're responsible for that design. We are responsible for that design. Uh, we're, uh, you know, of course, we see this as uh, the, the center, of the, uh, the new center of the community. It'll be uh, a gathering place for the town, a destination point for the town. As council knows, it'll be well utilized and. Uh, for festivals and events and other activities, skating rink and the reflecting pool, as well as a, a theater a stage or you know, washrooms, change rooms, uh, sand mm -hmm. room, and such will also be in that Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Parish. Yeah, I just uh, I just wanted to echo the. Staff has put a tremendous amount of work into this. It's uh, the site plan itself is extremely complicated, and there's a lot of issues. And it's you know it's uh, very uh, with the square and the buildings themselves. 
the negotiations with the developer, um, the whole thing has been a, a long process and complicated and, uh, and it's been very successful. But the other thing I want to say is that I want to um, acknowledge Council. And I want Council to just take, you know, it's, it's important every once in a while to just take a, a look around and a look back. You know, we started really seriously on this process um, after the 2003 election. We did a lot of things. We introduced the CIP program, the Community Improvement Program. Uh, none of this would have happened without the CIP. Um, we've, we've seen the redevelopment of the Harvard Mall. We've seen the redevelopment of a long time I saw the, the Verona site. We made improvements on Farrell Doughty, the realignment uh, of the Farrell Station and the realignment there. Uh, we, 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 we improved the town hall and the library and you know, the, the connection uh, and extension of Commercial Avenue down to Kitney, et cetera, et cetera. And there's really been a lot done. And it's really been because council was determined to redevelop and give this town a real downtown, and really in, in the fullest sense of the word. And this one that we're just coming to the end of the beginning, I'll put it that way, uh, has been a monumental pro project. And it's taking council kind of going, okay, <laughs> this is hard but it's the right thing to do. And never <coughs> taking their eye off the ball and making sure that this, it happened. And there's a sign that just appeared, I don't know if it, all of you have seen it yet, but there's a big sign that's appeared on the site as of yesterday. And it has one big word on it, together with some others, and that word is vision. And council has demonstrated vision. And you don't buy it on the market cheap, but it pays big dividends, and, and that's, this is a visionary thing. This is something that will build out over uh, 10, 15 plus years, and will be something that the community will have the benefit of for generations. You don't get a chance in a, in a term of council or in your period of serving council to do something that's truly big. We've done it with the waterfront, and now we're doing it with the, with the redevelopment of downtown. And so, I just want to say to Council, uh, it would not have happened without your determination that it, ha that it will happen. And I want to thank you all for that. Regional Councilor Jordan. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll echo some of those comments because I've always kind of held the belief that good things happen to people who wait and who um, persevere and uh, and, and also plan, and I think this is a perfect example because I think that, and I think it was in the late 90s that there was a session on uh, the community coming together to develop a downtown vision, and they talked about a people place, public place, uh, residential, all the things that are incorporated in this development. And um, of <coughs> course then the, um, I think in the late 90s, around or 2000, early 2000, when the drive-throughs, uh, the Verona site, and the huge outcry from the public that they didn't want drive-throughs in the downtown, and how staff and council worked to make sure that that vision was upheld and that drive-throughs weren't approved. And of course, when this um, proposal on this site came through with more drive-throughs, so it wasn't very difficult to realize the public would not support this. So that was, they felt very strong, as did council, about that. And um, all the work that's been put in place as far as the OP, the Community Improvement Plan, because we knew if we wanted to reach a vision that there needed to be some buy-in by the municipality or it just wouldn't happen. Looking at what's been done in, in other municipalities, it had to be put in place. And um, of course, obviously with this, it's, uh, it's been successful and the investment that we've made, um, the payback far exceeds it. I mean, it's just phenomenal in, in my mind when I see this. I wanted to ask, because this, 
we've, we've made steps forward in this downtown vision, but when I look at this, this is a huge leap forward in realizing this vision. And I see that um, as well, the regions incorporated in their um, um, future development uh, charges, the, the provision there for more work so that we can have um, further developments come forward. And of course, the huge payback to the region and the town. Perhaps um, someone, Mr. Skinner, could comment on that. I see this as a major, major breakthrough and uh, foundation for anything else uh, in the future. Through, through the chair, uh, you're actually right, uh, Councillor uh, Jordan. Uh, you know, this is the largest project ever undertaken in the region. You know, not just Ajax, but in the region. And, and it's substantial, as you've heard the numbers. Uh, you know, anytime we can spend $7 million to make 165, mm -hmm. it's not going to take us long to figure out what we're going to do with it. And, and beside that, just the revenue side of it, it's really creating that people place, uh, the destination. Uh, and a revenue base as well that will help sustain us in the future, uh, which I think is critically important. This is not a good news story, you know, this is a great news story for Ajax. Uh, it really is an investment in our community. Uh, along with the spending power of 3,000 people, <coughs> excuse me, which is estimated annually for about $70 million. So over that 40 year period, you're talking about $2 billion worth of spending power in our community. Uh, which means uh, jobs uh, and, and so much more. And uh, so it, uh, it really will help to shape uh, in a very substantial way uh, the look and feel of our community. Uh, and and uh, you know, I think uh, it will serve us extremely well uh, going forward in so many ways. You know, beyond the pure dollars and cents side of it, there's so many more around you know, creating that, that place and sense of place. And, purpose that is so important to people and people tell us all the time and you hear it every day around creating uh, a sense of community. Well this public square which again is you know we own now is it's an investment uh, that we you know, we're buying of uh, over two million dollars for that land uh, is uh, we'll, we'll pay back dividends in terms of uh, the opportunities that we will create there for the public to participate and actively get involved in our community. So um, this is a terrific news story, not just for today, but this will be a terrific news story for many, many years to come. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. And to hear that it's the largest project in, in the region, the regions have had, I think that tells us how significant it is. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the, the public square that um, this is a vision of our future, but also the tie-in with our past and our history, and that it's named after Pat Bailey, the first mayor, and of course the uh, design that is in keeping with uh, that that's on former land of Defence Industries Limited. I just wanted to say that the community committee who has been busy raising funds so that a monument uh, could be uh, placed here in recognition of the thousands of women who worked at Defense Industries Limited that uh, they've raised $65,000 to date and uh, hopefully will continue to do well planning future events so that um, this really is a place where people will be proud of and not only enjoy the surroundings, but learn the importance of our history as well. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Thank you. Um, just a comment. I can take no credit for any of this, being the new person on the block here, but I am certainly very, very proud to be a part of uh, really what is just going to be an in incredible place in Ajax and can't wait to uh, go and sit by the reflecting pond myself. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd want to skate. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. okay, so thank you very much, Gary, and staff. I'll move the receipt. Uh, okay, um, all in favor? Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, item 5.3 on Pickering Village Draft Heritage Conservation District Study Control Report. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, so I'm just providing a brief overview of uh, what the information is that's in the report, so it's mostly a status update for Council. 
as I know, this is another exciting project that uh, we've been working on as we move forward. So, um, some of the work to date is the town has retained consultant Philip H. Carter, architect and planner, and he's done a number of different uh, research to date, historical research, background research. We did have our first public meeting on June 14th, where we had about 25 people in attendance. And some of the comments were regarding the study area boundary, as well as the uh, insurance was an, a comment raised by a couple people. And in August, we had a study area walkabout, which was, it was a great evening, the uh, sun was shining, we had about 27 people come out. And everyone was really excited to learn more about Pickering Village, the history and the heritage. And uh, we also learned from those residents as well, because there's a lot of people that have a history of the village. We were able to take some information back from them. And then just uh, uh, on November 12th, we had our first meeting with the Community Advisory Committee. So just to recap, that's the committee where there's five citizens. Uh, they're residents, uh, a commercial property owner, a business owner, a member from the BIA, and a member from the Heritage Advisory Committee. And they provided us with some initial draft comments on the uh, draft study that is in your packages today. So one of the projects that the consultant worked on was doing a property inventory. So this is just a sample page of what it looks like. Of one of the properties, there's 58 properties in total. So the inventory provides the location, the year built, um, the, the architectural style, the roofing material, the cladding, a little description about the property. So in this case, um, you know, the windows are significant. And it also has a historical photograph or historical information where that is available. So just to go over the study area boundary, it involves Old Kingston Road, Elizabeth Street up to the cemetery, and then uh, west side of Church Street up to Sherwood Road. So as I noted, it is 58 properties. There's six designated heritage properties in the area. 24 properties are listed in our heritage inventory, which comprises of about 52% of the, the properties in this area are, are considered a heritage resource. And that is very similar to other heritage districts in Ontario. Um, and a lot of the new development that is in this area is also fits into the nature of the village. Some of the uh, findings of the study is that the curve of the Old Kingston Road is actually quite unique. Not only the fact that it curves and you have a new view, but also that there's um, a hill as you go up Old Kingston Road. So it's creating a new view as you're kind of driving or walking along that streetscape. And this is a, I just want to reinforce, this is a village setting where you have um, different setbacks between houses. You also have uh, I guess um, setbacks between houses. So in, in terms of a townscape setting where you actually have the buildings adjacent to the street, this actually has uh, it's trees or, or spaces in between those buildings. So from the uh, draft study that is presented, the consultant has noted that this area, Pickering Village, is worthy of designation as a heritage district under part five of the Heritage Act. And in addition to that, the consultant has recommended that the study area boundary be congruent with the boundary that I just showed you. So for next steps, we are uh, putting the study as well as that property inventory of all 58 properties on our project website. That will be up in December. We will be coming back with a second public meeting to be held, uh, I'm looking at late January right now, and um, public notices will be obviously put out for that meeting. And we will then uh, take that uh, public input, go back and come back to council out of uh, cat meeting probably I think March. And that will basically, that meeting will determine whether we move on to phase two. And phase two is developing the heritage guidelines themselves. So it, those guidelines will help to determine what types of uh, alterations will require a heritage permit help to uh, allow staff to review development applications as they come forward. And I just wanted to note that um, the Heritage District Plan has to be adopted by Council as well as a designation bylaw passed and registered on title before any district is in place. So if we do decide to move on to Phase 2, it doesn't mean a district's in place. It still has to be passed and approved by Council. So I just wanted to clarify that as well. And that's pretty much the end of uh, my presentation.
Councillor Rice. Thank you. So just further to that, um, with the history or with the heritage district plan, how long will that take us off? I would say because of summer falling in between there, we'll have something back, uh, I would think in early fall of next year with it back to council. The guidelines themselves I don't think will take all that long, but we still have to do further public consultation right. in terms of the types of alterations that the public would like to see or the property owners would like to see and what makes sense for us based on the existing heritage characteristics of the village. So the plan according with respect to property standards has flexibility in it so that it's the community that really um, helps to facilitate yes. what they see as important and not. not yes. yeah. So it's not as strict as people think it is. No, some plans can be more stringent. Uh, Mark on there, they regulate paint colors. I don't think that's the way we want to go in this district. I think it'll be looking more at a user-friendly plan, less restrictive. Uh, input from the property owners, what they would like to see requiring heritage permits. Um, so that would be where, how I'm thinking we're going to be leaning towards. So, what about the community improvement plan? When will that be so, started? Um, that we're also working on now. We've done a lot of background research already to date on other community improvement plans. We will be bringing um, probably a public meeting forward in the new year congruent with this study. And it'll look at the types of uh, or sorry, the types of programs that we would like to consider. So a facade grant would be, a, I think, a really good program that would be applicable in the village. It helps to property owners to maintain the properties, to implement maybe heritage style signage, those types of things. So that's we'll definitely be working on that as we move forward. So. Will it look at uh, the property tax rebate currently? Yes. Properties and yes. make the recommendations on those. Yes. And just if I may, one more question. Um, I, I understand why they have not included Church Street South. However, um, it has all the attributes that you're looking for. It has, it's a beautiful streetscape, and there are some beautiful heritage properties and mature properties with mature trees. How are, how are we gonna protect that in the future? I think what we'd like to see is the success of this plan as it moves forward. Not to say that the Heritage District can't be expanded to include, say, Church Street or Kingston Road as well. Um, at this point, there is a number of, I guess, plazas that are kind of right at Church and Kingston Road there. So it's a little bit intermittent in terms of the connection with the um, old classic Main Street commercial area and the Church Street side. So I think it will definitely be something that we would like to consider as we move uh, forward and understand the success if this plan were to, to go into place. So. So, uh, sorry, just one more minute. So is this going to come forward again then to council to review to see if they want to expand on the district or take away from the district? or? So how, I mean, I just don't want to put it on a shelf and never consider it again. No, no, no. I think what we would do is we would we would look at the existing, if, say the plan for this area does proceed and, and does get adopted, we would look at the success rate of that and then is there opportunity. Many other municipalities, what they do is um, they implement a plan in one place and then a lot of other property owners are excited about and they want to be in the district. So then they ask council, they come to council because they want to actually part of a heritage district as well. So I think it would definitely be something that will be on our radar, but we would like to can look at this study area, I think at this point in time, and then consider <coughs> the Church Street and the Kingston Road area as well as we move, move forward. So Thank I don't you. know if I can give you an exact timeline at this point, but. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions, staff? Um, Councilor Dyson, do you wanna the recommendations of staff. I will move it. Okay. Yes. All in favor. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move the feed and tariff. Somebody really wants the presentation. Steph has sat so patiently. It's short. Is it? Okay. I'll move it anyway. Good afternoon. Uh, my presentation and the report before you today is on municipal council support resolutions and priority points in the feed and tariff program. There was a review of the feed and tariff or FIT rules as well as the micro FIT rules uh, earlier this year 
And back in June, staff came forward to GTC with a report that had comments to the Ontario Power Authority on both those programs. Since then, uh, on August 10, 2012, the new feed-in tariff rules uh, were released, and the FIT rules apply to projects that are over 10 kilowatts. The um, micro-FIT rules apply to projects that are 10 kilowatts or less. And just to give you an idea of the difference, is if you're looking at a solar, uh, solar panel project, 10 kilowatts is approximately 50 panels. So a FIT project would be a larger commercial project. A micro-FIT project would be a project on a, a residence or a small business because they just wouldn't necessarily have the land area or roof area to accommodate that many panels, and therefore that large project. The new feed and tariff rules introduced something called a priority point system. The Ontario Power Authority introduced this system as a way to help them prioritize the applications that they receive. So the more points an application has, the higher it goes in the review process. You do need a minimum of one point to be even eligible to submit an application for a feed-in tariff uh, contract. And there are uh, a variety of criteria that can be met to uh, award points. For instance, one of those criteria is a resolution from a municipal council that would support a renewable energy project, and that resolution is worth two points. The priority point system is only applicable to FIT projects. It's only part of the FIT rules. It is not part of the micro-FIT rules. So these priority points would not be something that a, um, a small business or a, uh, a homeowner would be looking to, uh, to get because they're not available under that application process. The points are not... Um, You, an application does not need a resolution from a municipal council to be able to submit an application because there are other ways to achieve points, but what it does is it puts them in a better position to receive a contract. To date, we've had requests from three companies, all with regard to rooftop solar projects uh, for municipal council support resolutions. Solar Power Network, Man Engineering Limited, and JCM Capital. They're all located on commercial buildings um, and or retail buildings. The Ontario Power Authority as well, as part of the new FIT rules, has stipulated that as opposed to having an open application window, that they would announce application windows. So the first application window that is to be open is for all types of renewable energy projects under 500 kilowatts. They haven't made a formal announcement of when this window will open, but it is anticipated that it will open early next year for a 60-day uh, period. In terms of these resolutions, the Ontario Power Authority has actually provided templates or prescribed forms, and they have two types of resolutions, a blanket resolution and a site-specific resolution. A blanket resolution is um, valid for a period of 12 months. A municipality can specify the type of renewable energy project that this blanket resolution would cover. For instance, a municipality can say that the blanket resolution only applies to rooftop solar or it applies to rooftop and ground mounted solar. And that, that resolution would be valid for a 12 month period. And anyone who would make a request could receive that resolution once council passes it within the, uh, the 12 months that it is valid for. The other is a site-specific resolution, and that can be given to, uh, that's given to a, uh, an applicant on a project-by-project project or site-by-site -site basis. The site-specific uh, resolution allows you to look at each project and evaluate it based on its merits and where it's located. The Ontario Power Authority has also stipulated that a municipality must either use their prescribed templates for the resolution, or they can create their own resolutions, but it has to have significantly the same language as their prescribed templates. Now, 
In my report, I mentioned that their prescribed templates stipulate that a municipality must support a project without reservation. As of yesterday, the Ontario Power Authority has re, uh, revised these templates and removed the phrase without reservation. That's as a result of municipalities, including ourselves, talking to the, power, to the Ontario Power Authority um, and explaining that that phrase without reservation is too binding for a municipal council uh, to provide support under, you know, with that phrase. So they have removed that phrase. And in the report, um, there are revised resolutions as well that are part of the report. There are revised resolutions that have been provided to you at the beginning of this meeting that have removed that phrase without reservation. Now, a municipality, even though the resolution says without reservation, a municipality cannot put conditions into a resolution. Therefore, what that means is that a resolution cannot say that the Town of Ajax Council supports the project at such an address, provided that it's not on a heritage building. But a municipality is able to establish their own procedures and their own information requirements for what they want to receive to be able to evaluate any request for a resolution to be able to make a decision as to whether or not they want to uh, support the project and provide a resolution. The sole purpose of a resolution is just for the applicant to get points under the feed and tariff program. The resolution itself very clearly stipulates that that's the only purpose for the resolution and that it cannot be used for any other purpose, no other municipal approvals like building permits or any other purpose. We uh, reviewed about a dozen municipalities and their various approaches to providing resolutions. The approaches varied from blanket resolution to site-specific resolution to not charging for an evaluation to charging a, a nominal fee for an evaluation. And based on the review of, uh, of these various approaches, what we're recommending is that we develop our own process and charge a fee for the evaluation of these requests. The evaluation would only be for rooftop solar projects, primarily because those are the only requests we receive to date, but also because rooftop solar projects are generally considered benign, uh, and they're the most compatible type of renewable energy project in an urban or suburban environment. So the type of required information we would be looking for to be able to evaluate these requests would be a location map, a project, uh, size in terms of uh, kilowatts and solar panels, a cross section of the solar panel and racking system, and panel angles, as well as an image showing the visual impact, so a cross section from the street showing how visible the panels would be from the street or from an adjacent residential area. We're recommending that a $300 fee be paid, and this fee will be reviewed next year during the fees review um, to determine the cost recovery in terms of staff's time for evaluation and writing a report to general government committee. We're recommending that we only provide site-specific resolutions, that we will be using the Ontario Power Authority's uh, prescribed wording with the new version that removes the term uh, or the phrase without reservation, and that we also add an addition, additional expiry clause. Currently, the blanket resolution has an expiry clause of 12 months. We're recommending that we add an expiry clause to our site-specific resolution of 18 months. And the reason for this is because we have application windows that will be open, is when a resolution is provided to an applicant for a particular application window, and it's based on a review of the information they provided at the time, if for whatever reason they are not awarded a contract during that application window, we do not want this resolution to be used at a later date, maybe a year later, for a project at the same address that may have a different type of solar panel system or racking system that we hadn't had the chance to review and determine whether or not we could support. The 
benefit of being able to review these and evaluate them to provide a resolution is that currently, well, the Green Energy Act removed all planning act um, regulations with regard to renewable energy projects. So a renewable energy project is not subject to official plan, zoning, or site plan approval. They are still subject to uh, requiring a building permit in instances where that is applicable. But at the building permit stage, what we are looking at is compliance with building code and to ensure that the project doesn't affect the structural <coughs> integrity of the building. But issues such as visual impact aren't grounds to refuse a building permit. At the building permit stage, planning staff do review those applications. They do look at visual impact and they do work with the applicant, but it is based on the applicant's willingness to maybe locate the panels, um, have further setback from the building edge, or change the configuration of panels to reduce the visual impact. What we don't want to have is this example here that's in, um, in Toronto where you have very large solar panels and a very, uh, very strong negative visual impact. So of the three requests we, we've had, Solar Power Network has provided all the required information. Their project is proposed for 777 Bailey Street West, it's the Volkswagen building. They're proposing their project on the back of the building. There are no residential uses adjacent to the site. There is a parapet wall uh, around the building that is 0.45 meters high and the height of their solar panels is only 0.25 meters high. So the panels will not be visible at all. And it's, as such, it's recommended that we provide a resolution in support of this project subject to them submitting the $300 review fee. And again, the revised resolution that was provided at the beginning of this meeting, ha meeting has removed the phrase without reservation. The second request from Man Engineering is for rooftop solar at 65 Kingston Road East. It's the uh, Hakeem Plaza. They have submitted all the required information as well. They do have residential uses to the south and to the west of that building. However, there is a parapet wall on all sides of the building. The parapet wall is approximately 0.6 meters high, and the height of their solar panels is only 0.4 meters high, so again, those will not be visible. As such, we recommend providing a resolution in support of their request, and again, the revised resolution that was provided at the beginning of this meeting. The third request came in from JCM Capital. To date, we've only received partial information <coughs> from them, not enough to be able to comprehensively evaluate what the uh, legal impact would be of this particular project and whether or not we could recommend supporting it. We're continuing to work with JCM Capital. They have committed to providing us with all the required information. And at our recommendation is to provide you with a separate report for their request once all the information is received sometime early in the new year. Thank you. I'm sorry, Bert. Thank you for your presentation. On the uh, report page um, 134, page 6 in the report, it speaks to um, uh, the concern about there not being a requirement for the installation of a shutoff <coughs> bridge and the Ontario Fire Marshal's office is part of the subcommittee looking at this and as well that our Ajax Fire and Emergency Services staff have been trained on emergency response, uh, maybe through to the fire chief. I'm just wondering how much of a concern is this issue and does the fire department review these plans or do you become involved at all? In, so, in this? Through the chair, um, we would treat this as any live energized electrical fire. So we, we have plans in place, we have a strategy, we have training on everything uh, with respect to what we <coughs> continue to work with the fire marshal's office for this remote switch, which even with a remote switch, it would still be live between the panel and the remote switch. They never turn off. It's physically impossible. 
even such a thing as a bright light shining on the panel will generate electricity. So we would treat it very uh, with the appropriate care. And um, we would review through any, any plans that come through planning up through our site review process and fire prevention would be involved in any kind of uh, retrofit circumstance. And, and this issue about the switch, does it seem like they're moving in that direction? It seems that as, I mean, more and more are going to be installed that they should um, move quickly on that. It's my understanding that uh, the fire marshal's office is moving forward with how to integrate that into the, uh, we know, soon the Ontario building code, as well as to any kind of uh, amendments to the fire code through a regulation. So nothing uh, yet, just uh, discussions and conversations, but uh, they're happening in earnest at this time. I just would ask that if it seems to stall, <coughs> perhaps you would inform us so that this council could request them, because I think we should, we're going to see more and more, I'm sure, and we don't want to uh, have this remain as an issue, so I'd appreciate that and keep this posted. Thank you. Uh, we're going for it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yep. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, all in favor? Okay. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, okay. Motion to adjourn. All in favor? And they said 1:30. We're supposed to be at our next session. Yes. Yeah. So what time? 3:30.